Today I'm going to be taking a look at the HMOs or Endeavor Perpetual Calendar. It is a pretty, I guess, non-traditional looking perpetual calendar, but I think that is something that is definitely in the favor of this watch. It's just unique. Uh, just like with the last Mosu I reviewed, this is not my watch. I am borrowing it from a friend, but there aren't really any contingencies about the review. I don't have to say anything nice. I don't have to say anything bad necessarily. It is all just my opinion and my thoughts with some hands-on time with the watch. So let's get into the review. So we have a diameter of 41.9, lug to lug of 47.7, height of about 12.2 and a lug width of 20 millimeters. Some other general specifications, we're gonna have the H Moser HMC 800 movement beating way in here. Of course, this is their perpetual movement. It also has seven days of power reserve. The watch is, I believe, 30 meters of water resistance, so I'll have to check on that. This has a curved sapphire on the front here, as well as a curved sapphire on the case back. And last but not least, uh, this watch retails for 54,000 CHF directly from Moser's website, uh, but Converted to USD, that's about $55,000, give or take. Who knows, it might be closer to 60, but uh, somewhere around that $55 to $60,000 range is where you will find this watch. Uh, and this one in particular is a limited edition of 50 pieces. So moving on to the Dallas watch and for perpetual calendar, there's really not much to talk about. It is very sparse. It is very uh, almost empty. We do have the double baton at 12. We have the sub seconds at six, which is a kind of a like, not even half baton, but almost quarter baton at six o'clock as well. We have a large date at three, as well as a power reserve at nine o'clock. Again, you do have a seven day power reserve. And then if you can notice right there, we do have the hand that would in theory be pointing to the hour marker that denotes the month of the year. Now, of course, we don't have the hour marker, so you kind of just have to make your best educated guess and somewhat remember what month we're in. There is no leap year indicator on the front because that is on the back here. Uh, so it does declutter the dial, not to say that the dial was going to be cluttered in any way from the original design anyway, but it is nice that they kind of moved that to the back because it's not the most useful uh, piece of information. Looking at the dial a little bit more generally, we have what Moser calls their cosmic green fume dial. Of course, it's this bright, vibrant green that gets darker and darker towards the edges, almost a near black. And depending on the light, it can look basically like a black dial. Uh, for the subseconds, we do have a concentric circling in the middle, and it is kind of done more in somewhat of a lacquer slash flat color in comparison to the rest of the dial, which is done in this uh, fume style. Although the date isn't quite color matched, and of course I don't think a green date would have necessarily looked the best anyway, the black is very nice. It kind of ties in with the fume effect, and the white makes it very legible on that black date disc. One really cool thing about the Moser Perpetual is the fact that you can pull out the crown and you can set the date forwards and backwards. It makes it really easy. Uh, it's a nice definitive click. It feels good to use. It feels reassuring. This is a really cool feature built into the movement because basically for most Perpetuals, if you overset it by a day, you're kind of out of luck and you have to send it back to the manufacturer for them to completely reset the watch. Whereas with this, it's much more user friendly and it's nice to see. So really not much to say here. I think it is a beautifully executed dial. It's very simple. You just have the leaf style hands. You just really have the hands. I mean, there's more hands than indices on this watch, which is kind of a weird thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it still looks nice. It looks different. And I think the big date is a very important part, not only because it balances the symmetry of the power reserve, but I think with such an empty dial, a smaller date would have looked very much out of place. Uh, so the big date does really add a little bit more to the design than you would expect at first glance. So zooming in the dial, you can see we have this very fine, almost somber style texture to the dial itself. And you do have these classic black darker specks that we find on most of the Moser sunburst style dials and honestly most Fume dials that I've handled anyway. Again depending on the angle it does go very black at other angles it goes very green so it is a pretty well executed dial but as you can kind of see there towards the end you do get this kind of build up of that like black dotted texture uh, which some people might not like I don't mind it because honestly I never notice it and uh, it may be contributing a little bit to the fact that it goes so dark at the edges, which I do really like. Looking at the indices themselves, they are nice because not only are they classically black polished, but you do have so many facets, two on the sides and two on the ends, which give a really nice rectangular prism shape to the watch itself. Zooming in slightly closer to the indice, we can see the surface of it is not perfectly done. There are kind of some scratches or debris 
on the side of that indice on the left there. Moving on to the hands, you can see the story is pretty similar, unfortunately. There are a lot of scratches on that central hand stack, especially on the, um, the center pinion cap right there, and a majority of the scratches here on the base of that minute hand. Looking at the hour hand itself, it is fairly clean. As you can see right there at this angle, there are these tiny little dust specks on the left side of the hand. Uh, but the rest of the surface seems pretty clean. It is bifaceted, so it does have this really nice classic leaf style effect to it. The one side goes black, one side is still highly polished. So it reflects nicely in the light, but unfortunately it is not perfectly finished, but at the end of the day, nothing is perfect. Looking at the minute's hand itself, the story is a little sadder because we can see there is a kind of huge scratch right there on the end of the minute hand itself. So that is something that absolutely shouldn't have passed QC and it's a little unfortunate to see that it did. Similarly, we can see some more dust specks along the actual hand itself. So with the hands being such a major feature of this watch, at the end of the day, they aren't really finished that well. Again, this subseconds hand here has a bunch of dust specks on it. It is not the cl most cleanly done at all. And if we look at the power reserve hand, the story is pretty similar. There's a couple little specks on it and the sides of it don't seem that cleanly cut it just looks like a rougher piece of metal overall in my opinion so unfortunately although the dial is gorgeous and the green is done really well you can see the concentric circling there is really tight and adds a little bit more of a fun breakup of texture uh, the hands which are really the only applied element on the dial are really not finished to that great of a standard especially if you're talking about a fifty-five thousand dollar watch so moving on to the case of this watch and although it's not as interesting as maybe the dial itself there are some unique aspects about it. We have an almost all polished case here with some very minor hints of brushing here vertically along the case sides slightly and similarly here just in this tiny little portion along the case sides as well. One really interesting aspect that stands out to me is one, the bezel itself is concave the entire way through and weirdly enough it actually widens out at the 6 and 12 o'clock. Like as you can see there it's a very wide and flat-ish kind of bezel and it makes it a lot thinner here along the sides. So I don't really know what the design inspiration for that is, but it is an interesting point of visual interest and when you have it at this kind of head-on down the barrel kind of shot, it's a very unique architectural curvaceousness to the entire watch. So it's a little tiny design detail which although I don't really know the inspiration for it, at least it looks cool. You do have that same concave feel echoed here alongside in the lugs. Um, you do have the general solid surface and then these kind of portions machined away and then hand polished. It does look fun, it looks nice, it looks different. Uh, I don't think I've seen any other case manufacturers really do this type of styling other than Moser. So it is a very Moser-esque case in that way. Something I think these metal cutouts do is it makes the side of the case look a little bit more slim than it is. Obviously it cuts out some of the metal, it takes away some of the visual heft from the what would otherwise be a very blocky mid case. So it is nice to see and it obviously is a little bit more of a attention to detail that makes it a higher end watch. You can see the small pusher we have in the side here and that is the pusher you would actuate to uh, change the leap year. And then turning the watch to the other side we have the classic M signed Moser crown. Has really good knurling, it's kind of onion Reese's cup style crown. Winding the crown it does feel very nice. There's a lot of, I guess you can say resistance, like if you don't fully push the crown over you're definitely not going to wind it. And I guess it's a very reassuring feeling, like you have to be genuinely trying to manipulate the crown in order to give it extra power. If you push it in a certain way and kind of let go, it just will slingshot back. So it's a very interesting feature that I've never really felt before in any other crown. The crown also does have a much nicer feel and winding sound in comparison to the HMC 200 movement that I dealt with earlier, which it better be if it's a $55,000 watch at this point. It is both a lot quieter than the HMC 200 movement and it just has a more harmonious kind of, I guess, high quality sound to it. We do have this very beautifully finished Moser movement done with the classic Moser striping, a kind of three-quarter style bridge layout. Uh, all the jewels on display here very beautifully with this uh, gold outlining each one in all black polish in a way and on gloss in a way where it catches the light. It kind of goes from almost silver looking to gold looking to black looking depending on the light. One thing I've noticed with a lot of the Moser movements I've had hands on with is they don't tend to blue many of the screws or if 
blew any of the screws at all. As you can see, none of them here are blue. They are all just black polished. And while it, I guess, leads to a more utilitarian style look and a more cohesive design language, I think the blue pops would really add a nice color to it. Again, blue, gold, red, they're all tones that work really well. And uh, for $55,000, I mean, why not blue the screws? And then just before I zoom in on the movement for a second, we can see the entire case back here is curved, obviously to fit the wrist a little bit better. I would say that's maybe a weird aspect because if you have a larger wrist where this doesn't quite sit within the very middle, it probably will feel weird on your wrist. And if it's a 42 millimeter watch, um, it's maybe made for a larger audience right off the bat. But on my skinnier wrist, it does feel nice. It does help the watch conform. And thankfully the short left to lug does that as well. So zooming on the movement here, we can see it is pretty well finished. I'd probably be a lie if I didn't say it was one of the nicer looking movements that I've seen before. Uh, obviously it's not perfect, like if we kind of move it in the right angle, you can see there maybe are specks on that tiny little gold lip there. Uh, it, it's hard for me to see, so I'm sure it's probably hard for you to see as well. But again, there are some little small imperfections. Even there on the screw, there is a little speck right under the M, uh, or at least the screw that's under the M there. But overall there is a very nice just feel to the movement itself all the bridges are done well zooming here on the balance wheel we can see it does look gorgeous you can see some gears turning underneath um, but as we kind of move the camera you can see on the edge of that polished angle there is like a little bit of cut a little bit of a weirdness in the surface so that is unfortunate to see it is not the smoothest and compared to some other higher end movements I've seen, like this kind of on glage angling isn't the, I guess you can say widest. It doesn't stick out like crazy. It honestly isn't overly shiny either compared to some other things I've seen. So although it is a pretty great looking movement, I think at this price point especially, there are some other players that are doing a little bit better job in terms of the finishing of the movements. But with that being said, this is still probably one of the best user friendly perpetual movements on the market. So. Uh, there are definitely points for that, but again, even as I move this camera on that screw there, you can see there are more imperfections. Overall, I think QC maybe could have been a small bit tighter just because Moser is only making 1500 watches a year. That is not a huge output compared to most other brands, so uh, they could have paid a little bit extra attention and seen some of these more specs on the dial, specs on the hand, and some of these other kind of dust marks and specs on these this movement sides. Really quickly, before I move on to how the watch wears, taking a look at the strap and buckle, this is a I guess strap material that Moser is very known for using at this point. It's kudu leather. It has this nice, almost distressed look to it, a very cool tannish color. Uh, on the back, it is done with calfskin, signed H. Moser. And then we do have a matching white gold buckle to it. It is signed H. Moser in the buckle deployant part right there. It opens nicely, it closes nicely. It's not too thick of an overall unit either, so it doesn't feel too bulky on wrist. So overall, fairly nice clasp and pretty comfortable strap too. So moving on to how this watch wears, earlier I was wearing my 40 millimeter Sartori Billard just for a little bit of a visual comparison to the Moser here. So here we have the watch on my six and a half inch wrist and surprisingly, it fits. It is a 42 millimeter watch and I guess this is a kind of common theme with Moser. I tried on their 42 millimeter Heritage line, which surprisingly fit. I tried on this watch, which surprisingly fits. Uh, so a lot of Moser, if you kind of look at the specifications and you think that's usually out of the wheelhouse of what I wear, maybe try it on because they do tend to fit a lot better than you expect them to. Looking at it from kind of more down the barrel here, it is very curvaceous and conforms to the wrist nicely, sits pretty low onto the wrist itself, which I think is important for a heavier material like this in gold. Basically, if it's too heavy and if it's too top heavy, then it just won't feel right, it'll feel uncomfortable on wrist. But it's very balanced and overall, I guess the quote unquote center of gravity is a little bit lower, so it wears nicely. Looking at it from a side view again, of course it's not the thinnest watch in the world, but again, it does conform really nicely to the wrist. You do have a nice turn down from the lugs there. So overall, it's a very nicely wearing watch, surprisingly for its 42 millimeter diameter. And obviously the short lug to lug helps that a little bit. Um, one thing I will note is again, you do have the slightly curved case back. So if you've worn watches in the past and you have a bigger wrist and you've noticed uh, curved case backs don't feel comfortable, which I have heard from some people, maybe this watch isn't for you. Moving on to my first strap combo, we have this nice curved leather strap from uh, Veblenist. This is custom made, it takes maybe two, three weeks to get to you, but I think the color tones match perfectly. And of course with curved lug bars or curved spring bars rather, you kind of don't have a lot of immediate options for you. Uh, so you usually do have to go custom made. And there we have it on wrist. Again, you can see how relatively well the 42 millimeter wears on my wrist. 
uh, and we do have these very nice rich brown tones playing with the green, giving it in a very uh, nature, natural feel to it. This strap, by contrast, is made by Deluxe and is one of the very few ready-made curved leather straps that they actually have basically in stock available to get to you in maybe one to two weeks. Uh, and I think it pairs well. The green and the gray work really well. It mutes the watch a little bit. Uh, and of course, the kind of suede new buck texture, I think, pairs well. Looks pretty nice, wears very comfortably on wrist. The strap maybe is a little bit thin for the watch itself just because it is a little bit thicker and a little bit heavier, but it doesn't feel too bad on wrist, and overall, I think it looks pretty decent. And lastly, we have my tried and true Archer silicone strap. And although this is a $14 strap on a technically $55,000 watch, I think it is pretty nice. This is technically not a curved strap. This is actually a 21 millimeter silicone strap with a 20 millimeter curved spring bar in it. It does pair fairly well, I think. You have it matching the white tones of the date, the sub-seconds, and the power reserve, as well as the white tones that pop from the gold hands when they catch the light. So at the end of the day, I would still rock this combo, but <laughs> it may not be for everyone. So pros and cons with this watch, and I think one of the biggest pros and one of the things that surprised me the most is it fits, even though it's a larger sized watch. It is 42 millimeters, and uh, the fact that they used to make this series, and I believe 40 and a half, and they sized it up to 42 didn't really make sense to me, but even on my smaller six and a half inch wrist, this watch wore amazingly. So I do wish it was still in that smaller size, but as it stands and how it's designed and how it fits ergonomically, it still works. And kind of furthering that point of just design in general for the watch, it is a very Moser-like design. It has that classic Fume Moser has become known for. Uh, this particular model doesn't have the brand name on the dial, which Moser's been doing a lot recently too. I do think it would have been better with the like blind logo that's imprinted into the dial, but that just wasn't an option at this point. But going forward, that would be really nice to see Moser do a, uh, a lot more. I think that Fume combination with the blind logo is very much what their brand identity is moving towards. And I think it looks really cool if it's executed well. Uh, but kind of digressing more to this watch, again, it looks like a Moser. The dial is executed very well. It's ex executed very simply. And at the end of the day, it's just very clean for a perpetual calendar. You don't have a lot of sub dials. You don't have a lot of random text on the dial. You really only have every element that you need directly at your disposal. And stuff that can be pushed to the background, like the leap year indicator literally is pushed to the back, the back of the watch. In my opinion, it just is a very well executed design in terms of both, again, the case, the dial, and just overall aesthetics. And then my last pro is the fact that, well, I mean, yes, it's a perpetual calendar, but it's a really good perpetual calendar. Uh, it's not only legible, but it's functional. It's easy to use. Uh, you don't have to worry about oversetting it. You don't have to worry about going one day over, one month over, uh, one year over. It's one of those watches that can easily be set forwards and backwards without breaking the movement at any time of day. So that ease of use and that functionality and that uh, kind of ability to keep <laughs> the user from breaking the watch and a very expensive watch at that uh, is really, I think, sensical for such an expensive watch and for such a complicated complication within a watch. Moser's kind of engineering prowess and allowing the end user not really having to look through a huge manual on how to set their watch is I think a very, very beneficial aspect to this exact perpetual movement that they use. So moving on to cons, and while I don't have many, uh, the biggest con is of course the finishing. With the previous Moser that I looked at, which was the H Moser Heritage, it also had scratches on the hands. It also was not well finished necessarily. So to see this watch retailing closer to fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and it to actually have almost worse QC than that watch did, is is a little disappointing. I don't think it's out of the question to be upset by the fact this watch isn't well finished, uh, especially with the fact that with them decluttering a lot of the dial and making almost the hands and the very few indices that exist a very much focal point of the design, to have those pieces of the design not executed to a I would even say acceptable standard is a little bit ridiculous. So whoever's doing the QCM Moser needs to do a little bit better of a job. They need to be a little bit more stringent with it because again, they're only making around 1500 watches a year and they have the ability to take a little bit more time for each watch. And at the end of the day, if their, let's say quote unquote statement would be like, well, we have the highest quality uh, possible for the output we have. Uh, make less watches because again, I think at this price point for the prices that they're charging uh, for the 
assumed quality level that many people think they should have, what I'm seeing with the watches I've had hands on with, it's not really acceptable. A very minor con, I mean, compared to the last point, is the fact that again, I think the watch is slightly too large. Uh, it does wear well for its size and it doesn't look overbearing on my wrist at all, I don't think. But I would just prefer if they went back to the 40 and a half millimeter size or even possibly offered both size options. So it's just one of those things where I don't think there's really that big of a necessity to have a 42 millimeter watch, especially if you're doing a kind of design which is all dial. It makes watches usually feel larger than their dimensions would suggest. So a 40 and a half millimeter I think is more than enough space, more than enough real estate to execute what you're trying to. Final thoughts on this watch and I do really really like it despite its flaws. Overall it's probably one of those watches where the movement shines the most. It probably is the prettiest looking part of the watch, not to say the dial is bad looking at all because it still is executed pretty well. I also just think that's where a lion's share of the money or the cost in this watch is going to. It's the ease of use of that perpetual movement, the functionality and the user-friendly functionality that it comes with. What I really like about this Moser in particular is it is unapologetically Moser. <laughs> I'm not really talking about in terms of the QC. I'm talking about in terms of the dial design, in terms of how it feels, how it looks. Again, it has the classic Moser traits of the Fume, of almost being anti the rest of the watch industry. You go and look at any other major brand, their perpetuals almost are overly complicated to a point of like, is this even readable? Is, is the information I want, in theory, with a perpetual uh, able to be read at a glance of this watch? And this Moser solves that. It takes it in a completely new direction. The month indicator is very small, out of the way, very discreet, to where at times you can almost not notice it's even there. Uh, you can easily mistake this for basically a three-hand watch with a power reserve on it, and, you know, obviously a sub-seconds, but you know what I mean. Having seen this model online many times before, it didn't necessarily appeal to me. I always thought it was a cool idea. Having actually spent some time with one in hand for basically a week or so, it definitely won me over. It looks in hand a lot better than I would expect. It fits a lot better than I would expect. The movement operates basically what you would imagine a movement for this price point would. It feels very confident in hand. It is a very, uh, almost aggressive feedback to the winding, which is really nice, but at, at no point does it not feel premium. At the end of the day, you're not really buying this watch to be the best value on planet Earth, and you're probably not even buying this watch to be your one grail piece. Uh, this is more likely an addition to the collection, probably a kooky addition at that, but it does have a lot of charm to it, especially in terms of how well the perpetual calendar functions. At the end of the day, can you look past some of the QC issues uh, and just love the watch for what it is? I can at some point, but I think especially for what they're offering at this price point, it's a little bit unacceptable to me, but I'll leave that up to you guys. Thank you for watching my video. Hope you got something out of it and I'll see you in another one.